This side up, we are in some stuff, aren't we? Talking about the kingdom of God, how it is upside down when you look at the kingdom of this world. It is upside down. Everything from relationships to how we conduct ourselves even uh, as citizens of, of, a, of a nation, it's going to be different if you believe and follow Jesus. How you spend your money, it's going to be different. And man, this series has got us contemplating. It, it's, it's shaken some things in us, hasn't it? I mean, when we start talking about the kingdom of God, we have to start asking ourselves, do I really believe this stuff? Do, do, am, I, am I really about this? A, am I just you know, following Jesus because of some prayer I prayed when I was a little kid to, to not go to hell when I die? Or is he really the king of my life? Is he king of everything? Am I, am I welcoming him? Man, this series is, whoo. And, and we're teaching and preaching and, and responding to this word in a context, right? Where we're in a pandemic still, strange times. We've, we've walked through a quarantine for months and and we're trying to figure that out and what that looks like as we, as we open up our, our, our lives and open up our, 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 our communities. And, you know, how long would this last? We, we've experienced political and social upheaval, things that were fomenting under the surface that have just can no longer stay there. And we're responding to it. And we're, we're all, the, all the voices and culture and, and the media coming at us. The first week we just said, hey, if we're really serious about this, and, and if you don't believe and follow Jesus today, you're kind of off the hook. Man, you sit back. You just, you just watch the people who believe and follow Jesus have to lean in and do some business with, with Jesus. But I hope you see something that's compelling to you. I really do. I hope that you see something that, that's different and that brings light to you. That's what I hope. But if you believe and follow Jesus first week, we just had to say, hey, you got to put away your sword. You got to put away your sword. Jesus said to Peter, look, we're not going to use an offensive or defensive weapon here. We are going to, and Jesus healed the man that, that the apostle Peter uh, tried to cut, right? And, and so what, what does that mean for you and me? That means that, that if we are going to believe and follow Jesus, we have to follow him into that, that we sometimes have to... Uh, hold back our opinions and, 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 and not uh, offend people or defend our position politically and socially. Uh, we have to rise above that and say, no, I want to be a voice of light and I want to be a, a voice of healing in this time. And we happen to believe and follow Jesus during a time where we can make our voice known to millions of people in a millisecond, right? So that was week one. Week two, Sophia came out here and she says, hey, we're taking back some terminology from the culture. We're taking back some terminology from political agendas. We're taking back some terminology and some wording that God instituted. That man, man is just trying to figure out, but God said that justice is his. That justice is him making wrong things right and broken things healed and calling out the real enemy. She did a powerful job saying, hey, our enemy is not somebody who, who, who looks differently than us. It's not the person in front of us. It's not our family members. It's not somebody who votes differently than us. It's not that person that we fill in the blank. Our real enemy, according to Ephesians chapter six, is the strongholds and the principalities and the systems of this dark world that is influenced by an enemy, and that is Satan. It's not personal. Look to the person beside you say, it's not personal. Tell them that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. F follow along. Yes. I know that was hard. It's not personal. It's hard, though, right now to not take it personal, isn't it? It's just so hard. And yet we have to say, Jesus, I really know who the real enemy is here. And so when we talk about taking back terminology, we also have to clarify some things and say, when we talk about justice and, and then we talk about systems that are influenced by, by a dark force, we also have to recognize that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are trying to bring light to those systems. You know what I'm saying? We also have to realize that, that we live in a, in a country, a country that is, is, 
is it's citizenry. Many of us are believing and following in Jesus and trying to bring light to those systems. We live in a nation where we have to say, hey, I am proud of the country that I live in, and I want to be a healing voice in this country. And I look both at its past, its present, and its future with hope, with hope. And when I, when I, when I speak about my, my country and when I speak about uh, U.S. America, that I'm speaking as a citizen of the kingdom of God, but I'm also a, a citizen of this nation, and I want to be a part of being a way maker in it. I, I want to be a part of, of building bridges in it. And so you have to know that when we're anybody communicating from this stage, from this platform, who represents Waymaker Church, that we're, when we're talking about systems that are in our country, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're not saying that, 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 that our country is, is, a, is an evil place. I believe that the, the, the United States of America, with all of its flaws, is still the greatest place on earth to live to breathe, right? I've been all around this world. I've been in various cultures. So when we talk about systems, uh, dark systems in, uh, enforced and informed and put together by a dark enemy, we also have to realize that we are part of the solutions, but we have to acknowledge them. The other thing is this. When we talk about systems and we talk about justice, there are often people that don't get recognized uh, often. In fact, they, they don't want recognition a lot of the time that are standing at the gates trying to bring light and trying to bring push back darkness. Uh, who am I talking about? I'm talking about our law enforcement, the men and women who wake up every day and put their lives on the line. Yeah, right? You know what I'm saying? They put the well-being of their families on the line every day. I'm talking about the men and women who, who protect our country, who, who, who fight overseas to defend. And we never want them to hear that when we talk about systems that we have to confront with light that are dark in our own neighborhoods, in our own country, that what they're out there trying to protect, that that, that is not valuable but that is not valuable. And the fact that we stand with them, that that badge is heavy and that flag, that patch on their, on their arm is heavy and they carry it with a heaviness. And so we are not going to let, as we continue through a very provocative series, we are not going to let the enemy come in here and have his way and divide us and make us suspicious of each other. Here's what we have to realize, and this is what we gotta recognize. God has called this church to lead the way in a ministry of reconciliation, okay? He's just called that of us, and, and that is a heavy, heavy weight. And it's gonna need all of us, but it's also gonna need grace. It's gonna need grace. I'm gonna need your grace. And I don't, I don't deserve that grace, but I'm, I'm asking for it because I don't have a map for this. I don't. I, I, I literally every week just say, Lord, what do, you, what do you want of us? How are we supposed to, as a church, bring more light to darkness? How are we supposed to bring more healing to brokenness? How are we to be reconciled, not only to you and to each other, but to our brothers and sisters out in our community? Grace, we need each other's grace. We need patience. We need to look at each other and say, hey, he or she or they may not be as far along as me in this process. They may be at a different point in the journey, but I'm gonna be patient with them because that's what it means to live in the kingdom of God. That's what it means to believe and follow Jesus. Come on. Yeah, oh, it's, I'm not even in my sermon yet, y'all. I'm not even in the sermon. The other thing, and this is, this is so big, this is so big, and we gotta lean in on this, is humility. We, we, listen, we have to wake up every day and look in the mirror and say, I don't know Jack, okay? And I don't mean your neighbor named Jack. You know what I mean. I don't, I don't know Jack squat. Every day I am barraged with political agendas and social agendas and noise 
And I, I have to do my best to push that with temptations and all of those things and just say, Jesus, would you inform me with your Holy Spirit how to walk out reconciled relationships with my parents, with my spouse, with my children? How, how I can look differently at people that, that don't look like me or vote like me, people that sometimes make me crazy. How can I love them? How can I love them? It, it, every day we have to humble ourselves and say, this pride is not gonna do anything but cut people, hurt people. This pride is not gonna do anything but keep me fortified in my flesh. This pride isn't gonna do anything but chain me up to things that will hold back the kingdom of God in my life. And that's what I love about our church. Every week I see men and women come down here and it doesn't matter what the call is. They say, I need to humble myself before the Lord and I need to humble myself before my brothers and sisters in Christ. I need help. Can you imagine what would happen if we unleashed a group of people who had grace for each other and their neighbors, and they're patient with people's process, and they're curious and not judgmental, and they're humble instead of proud. Man, I believe revival will break out here in this room and wherever my voice is, and it will ripple into this community, and it will ripple across this country, no matter who's in the Congress or in the White House, or anything in between. Because Jesus ain't trying to be president. He's trying to be king of your heart and mine. Oh, come on. Back, uh, we got you. We got you. Luke chapter 16. Go there with me. My wife and I, my wife and I went last week on what we call a marriage enrichment retreat if you will, you could call it something else, but that's basically, we, we were going to go through some questions in what's called the blue book, the marriage blue book, and do some evaluation, see how we're doing. I said, well, hey, since we're going to be at Virginia Beach, why don't we rent some bikes and, we'll, and we'll, we'll just have some fun biking? She's like, she's like, I haven't rented a bike in 20 years. I said, well, it's like riding a bike. Yeah, I, I literally said that. It was, it was funny. I, I, I think I'm funny. It's like riding a bike, you know? You've, and she's like, well, my bike riding experience has not been, has not been joyful. And she tells, tells me about some trauma that she had, you know, with bikes as she was growing up as a little girl. I said, hey, look, we'll, we'll take it slow. So we end up buying a couple bikes, packing them up, taking them to Virginia Beach with us. I will tell you this. Uh, my wife over five days, biked over 50 miles. She, she did incredible. She got on some gnarly trails uh, with some gnarly terrain, and she owned it like a boss. She's ready for the Tour de France. You, you can tell her that. You say, hey. Um, while we were biking, though, uh, I had these sunglasses on, and they were kind of, they, they kind of shielded me from the sun and kept me focused on things. At one point, though, during the week, second to last day, my glasses fell off, hit the, hit the, the, the asphalt. Um, I went to pick them up and put them back on, and there was a scratch right there, right where my eyeball was. So I, you, know, you know how you just can't get away from it? It's like, like if the scratch was down here, it'd be fine. If the scratch was over here in the corner, it'd be fine. But it was right there where my vision is affected. I thought, no big deal. My eyes will get used to it. Within 15 minutes, I had this splitting headache. I couldn't take it. I couldn't stand it. And now all I could see was the world through this blemish. All I could see was the world through this splitting headache. It was affecting my vision of the entire world. I want you to get that visualization because what we're talking about today if we have it in the wrong place in our life, it literally will affect everything else in our life. The way we see relationships, the way we see our purpose, the way we see our career, the way we see everything, even all the way down to the way we see our Heavenly Father. What am I talking about? Here we go. You ready? I'm talking about money. <gasps> now, here's what just happened. Two groups of people just lost it. Group number one, the people who just brought their friends to church for the first time. 
Yep. You got to come to my church. You're going to love it, man. It's going to be awesome, man. You know, you know, people, people are going to love you. And, you know, Pastor John, he's going to preach a, he's going to preach a message. It's going to be right for you. And, and all of a sudden, you just heard me say money. And you're like, I'm so sorry. I get it. I get it. Other group of people are like, oh, man, is this a message on tithing? Yep. See? You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Is he going to ask me to give to the church at the end? Here's the day. I love to preach messages about giving to the church because I believe the church is the hope of the world and that we should invest in it. That's not this message. So relax. Okay? Relax. In that way. But we're going to stir some things up. All right? You guys with me in this? You with me in this? Let's, ju- let's jump in. Luke, check. come on. Yeah. Oh, I knew, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I saw you back there. I was like, he's going to get rowdy. He's going to get rowdy. Luke chapter 16, verse 14. Here we go. The Pharisees, who are they? They are the religious leaders of Jesus' time. They are, the, they are the, the ones that people look to because they supposedly speak for God in their community. They claim to know and speak for God in their community. And that is their intent, and their intentions are noble. They are the Pharisees. How does Luke describe them? Who were lovers of, say this with me, one, two, three, of money. Money. They loved them some money. It didn't say that the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders of the time that claimed to know and speak for God, loved people. They were lovers of people. No, that's not how they were described. They were not lovers of God even. Wow. I mean, these guys were holy. These guys uh, wore special robes and, 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 and read the scriptures, the prophets and the poets and the, the patriarchs of the Old Testament. And yet it said that they were described as lovers of money. Hmm. They heard something. They heard all these things. What did they just hear? Well, if you go up and you look at the verses ahead of what we're reading right now, you notice that Jesus tells a parable, and he told a lot of parables. He told a parable of a shady money manager, and he knew that the Pharisees were listening to him. And right after It says that he told this story of the shady money manager, and he gave context and teaching and principles to it. It says that the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, what? They repented of their sin and their idolatry and where they had put money in their life, and they started to follow Jesus. And when he rose from the dead, they were there in the upper room got the Holy Spirit, and started the church, right? Is that what it says? Nope. It doesn't say that at all. It says they ridiculed him. I don't like what you're saying. I don't like what you're saying. In fact, I have a problem with you, Jesus. And here's the thing. From time to time, if you believe and follow Jesus, you too will rub up against this as well. There will be moments when your flesh will want to take right back over, when the voices around you will get louder than the Holy Spirit. And you'll hear this word from Jesus, and you'll be tempted to say, I, Jesus, you can have this, and you can have this, and you can have that. I will go to church on Sunday. I'll watch sometimes online. I'll help little old ladies across the road in Jesus' name. But don't mess with my money. Jesus, don't mess with my money. And that's how the Pharisees were. They ridiculed him. They didn't like this. They didn't like this. Here's what we're going to see today. When money is our king, we will struggle with Jesus' leadership on almost every level. Okay? Remember, if you don't believe and follow Jesus, you're off the hook today. Right? Just this this is a word that you might go, wow, I hope they get that. When money is our king, we will struggle with Jesus' leadership on almost every level. Some of you have relationship problems right now in your marriage, and you think it's if he would just, and if she would just, and really you just need to open up your, your bank account and go, what do we really value? Who do we really worship? 
And that starts to set in motion some things that are rippling into your marriage. Did you know that financial stress and disunity is, one of, is the number one reason for divorce in this country? Second only to infidelity, or sec, second is infidelity. You would think it would be the opposite, but people get stressed out and disunified on how they earn and how they spend and all of that. The money is the source of the tension. And if Jesus is not king of our life, okay, then, then everything is going to be complicated. Everything is going to be unclear and it all gets manifest so simply in the money. As money becomes our security, status, and satisfaction, we will struggle to see and live out the kingdom of God. Think about this for a second. We just went through a pandemic. Right around, um, let's see, March, everything starts shutting down. People start losing their jobs. Some of you in this room uh, went into a situation where you got a phone call from your company says, hey, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to let you go. We're gonna have to put you on a retainer or whatever. You're not gonna get paid for a while. Some of you, it was, it was later on. It was, in, it was in April or it was in May. You, you, you started going through this struggle and it tested your faith. You started to go, do I really trust Jesus to be my sustainer to be my satisfaction? Do I trust him in this? And all of that was put on the line in that moment as a follower of Jesus. Why? Because this, the money is telling us something about our hearts. The money is telling us about what we value and who we really worship and who we believe is truly our sustainer and our salvation. Now, I wanna back up. We're going to go to verse 10. So uh, jump back up to verse 10 of Luke chapter 16. My friend turned 50 this week or this past um, month, and he wanted to go away with uh, some friends. And I was, uh, I was in that group, and he wanted to fish yesterday. So we got on a boat, and we went fishing. Now, I don't know anything about fishing, and, but I was the captain of the pontoon boat. So I felt pretty important. It's like, hey, man, you tell me where you want to go. Here's what I recognized about fishing in a boat on a lake with real fishermen. There's an etiquette. And you better know that etiquette or you're going to get some dirty looks on the water. So here's what I found out real quick. Uh, other fishermen don't like company. They don't want you rolling up in your pontoon with your country music playing going, hey guys, how's the fish? They want to be left alone. They have territory and you have to know this about fishermen. You have to know that if they've, if they've got that territory and they're progressing this way, you stay away from it. You go to the other side and, and you keep your mouth shut. There's no waving, there's no hello, there is. You're fishing, we're fishing. We stay out of each other's way. I didn't know this. I didn't know this, but I found out real quick. The other thing that I found out real quick is as I'm pushing buttons on this boat that we're on, I'm, you know, going through the GPS, the Garmin, and all of a sudden I find this one button that says sonar. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I was like, oh, sonar, what is that? So I pushed it, and the, the screen lit up. It was like, Phew. And I imagined those sounds underneath the water, you know, like that was all happening in my head. It's like, that's happening underneath the water right now. I wanted to shout that to some of the other fishermen, but I didn't want them, you know, to get upset with me. Hey guys, we got sonar. What the sonar was doing though, what it, it was telling us what was underneath the surface. It was telling us the depth of, of what was beneath the water. Now, I want you to hang on to that because we're gonna, we're gonna get into something that's going to be really a, a, an instrument to show the depth of our faith and our character. How do we really believe in this thing that we call the kingdom of God? Verse 10, 
Jesus, after telling the parable to the Pharisees about what? About the corrupt money manager, starts to unpack his teaching. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is dishonest in much. Jesus starts unpacking the principles of the kingdom of God when it comes to earthly resources, earthly possessions. And here's what he does. He takes this thing that we might think is completely detached from our faith, completely detached from our values and our worship, that we try to just keep over there to ourselves, and he puts it right in the center of our faith. He makes money one of the instruments to literally sonar right into our hearts to see who we really worship and what we really value. Write this down. Our faith and character are revealed by how we handle earthly resources. How we handle earthly resources. I want you to look to the person beside you and say, it's in the money. Go ahead, tell them. It's in the money. It's in the money. It's in the bank account. Yeah, it's in the bank statement. Really and truly, like we can go to Bible studies and we can wax eloquent in our theology. And sometimes we do that. And I'm not, I'm not knocking that. We can do that. We can come to church and we can sing pretty. Ooh, I wish I could sing pretty. But I can do sound effects. Mm -hmm. we, we, can, um, we can hear good sermons. I hope this is decent. Right? You can hear it, right? We can do all of that, and really, it has no indication of the depth of our faith. Why? Because Jesus just did something to these lovers of money. He put how we handle earthly resources right in the center of our faith. He said, you want to know how somebody is? You want to know who they worship and what they value? Look in their bank account. Yeah, but look in the bank account. It's in the money. It's in the bank account. Our bank statement is the clearest reflection of what we value and who we worship. It's in the money. It's in the bank statement. You should try that sometime. Somebody, friend of yours, you know, yeah, man, I just... I just love Jesus, man. I'm just all about it. Well, let's look at the bank statement. Hey, wait a minute. Right? Before we do that, though, maybe we should look at our own. Everything's okay back there. Do we value integrity and generosity or not? It's in the bank statement. Do we value integrity and generosity or not? Because it's in the bank statement. It's in the money. Like that, that really just this tells you, because you, you and I can go out there and we can say all these flowery words and we can, we can talk about integrity and we can talk about the things that we're doing that are, that, that are so generous in, in the world. And, and we look in the bank statement and, and there's really no reflection of that. Or there is. There's just this, this reflection of, hey, even when it's hard, I'm going to have integrity with my money, especially when I'm doing my taxes. Oh, Hmm. Question number two, do we trust God or money for our sustenance and salvation? Do we trust God or money for our sustenance and salvation? That's a question we have to wrestle with because it's in the bank statement. It's in the bank statement. If you want to know who I really worship and who I really, what I really value, it's in the bank statement. Jesus goes on. If then you have been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you? Or if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Jesus is going right after it. And he's saying, hey, you cannot separate how you handle your earthly resources with whether or not you trust God and whether or not he's going to trust you. 
Write this down. How we handle earthly resources influences our trust in God. Do I really trust him? And God's trust in us. Do I really trust him? If I trust him, then I'm willing to say, God, everything that I have in my earthly possessions and resources is yours. It's yours. And today I will use it however you want. When I go to the grocery store, Jesus, it's yours. When I go to the gas station, Jesus, it's yours. When I go to the mall, Jesus, it's yours. When I go fill in the blank, Jesus, all of this is yours, and I will let the Holy Spirit not just lead me in a prophetic word on Sunday morning, I will let it lead me. I will let your spirit lead me literally in how I go to the store. No servant, Jesus says, can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve, here it is, God and money. Hmm, hmm, I want that to sit there. In just a second, I'm going to invite some friends of mine to come up here. The Mostakis family is going to come up here. Uh, this was not um, planned. The Mostakis is set through uh, Nick and Julie Mostaka sat through the first service and they came up to me afterwards and they said, everything you just said, everything you just taught is the biggest thing that God has unpacked for us right in the midst of a pandemic. And I'm going to introduce them in just a second, but I want you to, to, to go back to what we just said, that we cannot serve God and money at the same time. So if Jesus is our king, here's what we've got to understand, how we handle earthly resources will either align or not align with the priorities of God, okay? Handling, if, if we really believe Jesus is king, our earthly resources will continue to align with increased love for God and for other people, season after season after season of our life. That's, that's just what's going to happen. You know, if we, really, if we really say, Jesus, you're the king of my life, he's like, okay, all right, before we do anything, are you willing to align the earthly resources, literally the shirt off your back and whatever's in your bank account, are you willing to align it with the priorities to love God and to love people? Because here's what Jesus does. He says that the greatest way you can love God is to increase your love for your neighbor. You see, our relationship with God isn't just vertical, it's horizontal. And Jesus says, look, you will align your earthly resources to an increased love for your heavenly Father and an increased love for your fellow man, your neighbor. And that will, over time and seasons and ultimately generations, continue to increase. So I want to teach three principles, and then I'm going to ask the Mastakas to come up here. So write these down. Kingdom principle number one, generosity over greed. Generosity over greed. If you are flowing in the Holy Spirit with your finances, there will always be a generosity over greed mindset. You'll always be thinking, how can I be more generous, not how can I keep more? How can I be more generous? Question, how much can I give of what is gained? That's the kingdom principle question for number one. Number two, kingdom principle number two, generational over self-indulgent. Generational over self-indulgent. Here's the question you're gonna ask yourself. How can I bless my children's children? You, you see those bumper stickers? You know, I'm spending my children's retirement. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of a hokey joke. But, but, but what they just told you is uh, we're pretty much just thinking about ourselves right now and, and we're not thinking about our children's children. We're not thinking about how we can set them up for kingdom blessing and kingdom opportunity. On, in contrast, I was with my friend this weekend. Uh, his Bible was on the coffee table where we, were, where we were staying and it looked a little tattered and a little worn and he started to tell me the story of this Bible. He says, my father... Okay, his, his, his dad, every year reads through the Bible. 
he gets a Bible, buys it, and he reads through it, and he makes notes, and he underlines things, and he writes to his children and his grandchildren throughout this journey through the Bible each year. And at the end of the year, when he's done reading that Bible, he'll give it to one of his kids or one of his grandkids. That is a man who has a generational mindset. Even his relationship with God, his intimate notes with the Lord becomes something he opens up to his children and his children's children. Listen, if you and I are really going to go after this kingdom of God stuff, and if we're really going to believe and follow Jesus with everything, we have to think generationally about earthly resources. We have to set the next generation up for success. That means that we're not just thinking about next year. We're not just thinking about retirement. We're constantly bringing our family close. And we're saying, hey, we want to help you accomplish this for the kingdom. And so we're going to say no to these things. And we're going to say no to those things. And we're going to say yes to these things. Kingdom principle number three, strategic over impulsive. Strategic over impulsive. Does my spending reflect a kingdom vision or an impulsive reputation? Kingdom vision, what is that? I'm thinking every day, every week, every paycheck, every season about how this is going to be connected to an increased love for God and other people, not how can I get mine or get that new thing. Now, are we going to buy things? Of course. Are we going to, 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 to go on a vacation? Absolutely. Are we going to spend the money? Yes, absolutely. But we're always doing it with this mindset, generosity over greed, generational, right? Generational over right now, and strategic over impulsive, which means I have a budget. I have a bank account, and it's connected to an increased love for God and other people. Wow. So, I want you to welcome up here Nick and Julie Mastakis. Come on up here, Mastakis. Yes. All right, we got mics for you. We got chairs for you. Come on up. Uh, while, they're, while they're finding their place, um, here we go. I know we got we to kind of sit six feet apart. You know? <laughs> um, while they're taking their, their, their spots up here, um, I, I've been on a journey with the, with the both of you for, you guys have been here, what, three and a half years? Yeah. 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 And so to hear the word that you gave between services made my heart just beat really fast. And, and I have so much joy for you guys because I know some things are clicking. And, and so you're, you're not even a year into this journey. So some of us would say, hold up on that story. <laughs> hold up on that story for, for another year. But I just believe the Lord brought you so that you can speak to some people uh, about something today that is so connected to worship. So Nick, tell Tell a little bit about your background, and Julie, you, you chime in as well, and, and let's get that story first. Okay. Um, so our background, I mean, um, you know, I, I grew up in a family with my mom and my brothers, and, uh, and Julie and I have similar backgrounds, kind of grew up with our parents doing uh, what they could for us as we were growing up, but we really both remember uh, that just that family of living paycheck to paycheck, and even um, just, just even as we first got married, we made some decisions about money, but I, I'm not even sure if it fully clicked what, what we really needed to do. Um, I mean, it was still, we were kind of in that rhythm, and it was just like, man, like just trying to get through, just trying to get through, just trying to get through. And we actually hit a place where, I mean, in so many ways, uh, we were rock bottom, and we were in a place where we, we, we had to even look at our money. We didn't even have much. I mean, I think you could fill in a little bit more there. Yeah, we both kind of grew up in a way where um, my family was very much like, we want to have the biggest and the best and the most and all of these things. And um, meanwhile, that wasn't reality. So we kind of were, I was always the kid that was like, somebody was giving me a handout and somebody was like, oh, this is the, the charity kid. We're going to give her something because her family doesn't have anything. Um, and we both came from divorced families and 
um, kind of from the very beginning decided that there were some generational things that we were going to try to figure out. Um, but like, as Nick said, when we first got to Lynchburg in 2017, we were kind of rock bottom. Um, and this church kind of came around us and pushed us. And this last season, the Lord has been really intentional about breaking some generational things that we've carried um, with our families, uh, specifically with our children and raising them. Yeah, that's so, that's so big because here's the thing. And, th- and this, is, this is what I want to say. You could continue to be a financial uh, rock bottom and live paycheck to paycheck. And Jesus still loves you, right? And, and you still have kingdom effectiveness, right, on some level. And this is the point that we, we, we just have to see. But there's this whole other dimension that Jesus is trying to, to teach us Absolutely. about this resource, earthly resources, and how they're connected to our soul that we could not get in our whole human life and miss out on a really powerful thing that God wants to do in us. And you guys started to realize that, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, I, I, we've been t- talking about this even just last night. It was like midnight, and we just couldn't stop talking about how good the Lord was. And, and it's been interesting. We were talking about this. I would say that 2020, which is, it's almost funny to say this in 2020, has been the best year in our walk with God and our relationship with God and what our family is experiencing in, in, in that entire way. And so much of it has to do with the fact that we've gone to a place where I think the world tries to stop us from going or, or doesn't even tell. Like, you don't even, and it's just, man, when you go to this depth, it, it just, yeah. I think it's really easy to put your eyes on yourself when things are hard and going through a pandemic and, you know, schools are shut down. So we're teaching our kids at home and we're working full time at home and things were just crazy. And it's like the more that this season that started out kind of, challenging the beginning of this year was kind of challenging and the lord just kept saying like turn your eyes to me and turn your eyes to people and the more you turn your eyes to me i'm going to show you people and so um and f- do you want me to go into this part yeah i think this is big because for you it started with generosity yeah which did. is kind of backwards <laughs> right usually yeah. it's like you know get your stuff together like get your <laughs> like, yeah. So I don't want to, you, you tell it, you tell it. Yeah. So we, um, one thing that we believe is that life changes happen over a dinner table. So um, I'm not the cook in my family. Nick is the cook in our family. And so our heart has always been to have people around our dinner table. Um, and so when the pandemic hit and nobody could go anywhere, we kind of hit this point of like, well, how do we, how do we love people and what do we do? And it was always on the hardest of days that the Lord would say, you need to take, and we call it, we jokingly called it like the baked ziti ministry. You need, ministry. To, you need to take food to this people, to these people, and to this person, and to this person. And, and so there were days, there was one day in particular, it was right after the kids got sent home, and I'm working full time, and I work at a call center, and I'm trying to answer phones. And it was kind of like a breaking point day. And that day, the Lord was like, you guys are going to take food to all of your, we lead a community, led a community group. And the Lord just put it on our heart to like take food to all the people in our community group. So um, we, he spent all day making big ZDs and we packed it in his little, he has a catering box thing. Um, and we put it in our car and we put our kids in our car and we drove to everybody's house and dropped off food. Um, and it was interesting because it became a thing that like, not only were we paying attention to, but our kids started paying attention to, and they would say, mom, who are we taking food to? And then they would see a friend and they'd be like, by the way, we told so-and-so to come for dinner. And we're like, it's six o'clock. You didn't, we, I mean, they can come. We always have food, but we just probably need a little bit more notice than that. But it was just neat to see how yeah. the days when we didn't know if we had money to do this for people, the Lord would say, no, just do it anyway. Yeah. And we did. And then as we did, the Lord just continued to put people on our path that needed to be loved on and cared for. And, and food was just a really tangible way to do that, to serve our community. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, finish, finish this thought because what started happening as you guys were giving food away, yeah. God started showing up in another way. Oh, it was, it was just, it was crazy. I mean, I was going to back up with that as well as like, one of the things the Lord asked us to do in the beginning of 2020 was to start a blessing fund in our account. And that's what we call it, because um, I'm not really creative, so that's clear and it tells me what it does. And uh, we made this decision, because we'd gotten a little extra money from somewhere, that we were just going to use it to bless people. So whenever the Lord laid someone on our heart, we we're going to bless them. And 
we started like just creating a rhythm. So as a part of our budget, you know, we, we got what God gave us, we tithed, and then we went ahead and we put something in the blessing fund. And what we started to know is God kept, notice was that God kept filling up the blessing fund. Like we had to do nothing for that fund to be filled up. And it started becoming just exciting because it was like, man, like we can use this money. So when somebody said, hey, I can't do this this week, or man, it's been a hard week at home. Can you drop something by it? We could just do it. And it's been interesting because, um, I was trying something out before the pandemic. A lot of us were trying things out, and I was doing some catering, and, um, and I kind of just gave up on it during the pandemic. I was like, okay, we can't, we're not doing events. We, you know, we can't, you know, two people is more than enough, so whatever. And I just kind of like put it to the side, and I was like, Lord, I don't know what you want to do with this. And so we started doing this big ZD ministry, and we started blessing people with food. And as we sort of hit the summer, all of a sudden, People started calling me, and they're like, hey, we hear you do food. Would you be able to do it for this wedding? Would you be able to do it for this thing? And, and, and honestly, like, it's, it just blows me away because I haven't done a single bit of advertising or telling or speaking about it, and I ended up I just finished my third wedding, and I'm on to my fourth in two weeks, and it's, and it's all God. I mean, he's just literally wow. opening doors left yeah. and right. Faithful with a little, faithful with much. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. like this stuff really works, y'all. It does, yes. It's like Jesus really meant this <laughs> stuff, right? It's so true. Yeah, yeah, so you true. clap for that. I, I, I think it's, I think, it, I, you know, obviously God orchestrated this, right, yeah. where you guys are living this out, and I mean, you're both fired up at the end of the, of yeah. the first service, like, like, man, people got to hear this, right? Yeah. Because what is, it, what is it doing in your faith right now? Oh, it's, I mean, it's just... It's rocking our faith in the best way possible, and it's taking not just us, but our children, and I believe their children's children, and so on, and so on, and oh, so on. Oh, don't think generational now. Uh-huh, absolutely, that's Calm right. Calm down. I think that we have, this is us looking at the enemy and saying, this generational stronghold is done. I mean, you mm. can't have this territory, and it's yeah, you better challenging get our family. By that. Yeah. And I think for me, it is, anchoring my soul to Jesus because there are times where mathematically in my head, I'm like, I don't know if we can do that. And I feel the, the Holy Spirit say like, do it anyway. And we do it and we see, like there have been times where we felt like the Lord told us to do something and literally the next day somebody called and said, hey, can you cater this wedding that I'm doing? And it's like every time that we ask the Lord, do we continue doing this? The Lord continues to provide. And now to see our kids responding to that and knowing like the Lord, not only can we say like the Lord is with us, us, but I feel steadfastly anchored into the heart of the Lord because I've seen him care for our family and I've seen him provide for our family and I've seen him um, just every time, you know, the Bible says like you, people joke about like challenging the Lord with money, like you can never outgive God. Like we, we are living and breathing testimonies of the fact that we just decided to be obedient to whatever the God, whatever God asked us to do. And every single time the Lord shows up twofold of what we did before. Yeah. Ooh. I, I, this is powerful, and, and I'm just going to, you know, uh, when you guys came here three and a half years ago, you, you guys were broken, Absolutely. you know? You were losing your faith, pretty yeah. much. I mean, you, you've given that testimony before, yeah. and, and then and you didn't know where you were going to get your next meal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and to see how your journey now, uh, where... Your, your faith has been restored. Your testimony is that of uh, not a poverty mindset, not a debt mindset, but one of st strategy and kingdom blessing and generational thinking and generosity for your fellow man, whether it's, you know, fine cooked Italian food uh, or bringing somebody around your, your table. I think that's how revival starts. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's not always just a church service where something breaks yeah. out, right? It's well, so and testimony to that, our oldest has always been, he's our very black and white child, very logical. Um, he asks a lot of like logical kind of brainy questions about God. And mm. we've always said like, Jesus, you're going to have to literally show up in front of him. Um, and just a testimony, like he from a kid who didn't, there's been seasons where he didn't want to come to church and it was like not something he wanted to do. Um, he got asked by his room leader this past week to lead worship and he's in first grade and he's leading worship mm. in Way Kids. Come on. Woo! And God is working on his little six-year-old mm. logical black and white heart 
Yeah. Um, and so it's neat to see not only is the Lord doing something in us and in our marriage, but in our kids that yeah. is changing their lives. Man, guys, this next generation, watch out. Mm. Watch out because of, because, because of what you're doing right now, mm. right? You're going to see your kids build on the platform mm. that you are setting, and God's going to bless you for that. Can you guys give it up for the Mastakases? Can you thank them for, for their testimony? Thank you, guys. Um, go ahead and stand with me. Uh, I want to I draw your attention to what the Apostle Paul says. You know, it's like, how does this all come back to the gospel, right? I mean, everything's coming back to the gospel. And, and you know, even when Jesus is saying, hey, order your, your earthly resources with a kingdom mindset, generational, generosity, strategic, right? It, it comes back to these words that the Apostle Paul speaks to the church, and that's you and me right now. He, he spoke it 2,000 years ago, but he's speaking it through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and the unity of the church right here and right now. Not only in this room, but whoever. But somebody's on the treadmill at the YMCA right now getting ready to get blessed. Hang on. So I, I, want, I want to I just read this to you. Second Corinthians. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. Controls us. What controls us? The love of Christ, meaning it, it becomes the, the, the guide, the magnetic force of our life. But how does that happen? Not, not just by being religious and not just being, you know, uh, you know getting in you know, church clothes and, and coming to church. Because we have concluded this. There's something that we've come to a conclusion of in our mind and our heart. And what is that? That one has died for all, Jesus Therefore, all have died, and he died for all. So, so right there, Jesus is the substitutionary death for you and I. You see, sin brings death into the human story, and that death separates us from God. And yet Jesus, Jesus died in our place. Jesus died on a cross to say, I didn't just come to live to show you the heart of God and the kingdom of God. I actually died so that sin wouldn't keep you from entering it. Oh, I'm about to preach again, right? And then he raises from the dead and he says, now that is your inheritance. Not only is it your inheritance in eternity, it is the power that you will live in right here and right now. And in just a little bit, we get to see a baptism that's just a celebration of that. But I, I, want, I, I want to bring this home. That those who live, that's you and me, might no longer live for themselves. I no longer, it's no longer about me. It's no longer about me. We live in a culture, we live in a society that says, live your truth, you're it, do whatever you want to do, and we have the highest rates of depression. We have the, the highest rates of people losing their minds, people trying to medicate their pain and distractions and drug addictions and all kinds of sin cycles. Because it's me, 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 me. And, and what Jesus says through, through, through Paul's words here is, when you recognize what I've done for you on a cross, I gave up my life for you so that you could have life eternal. So that sin, evil, and death is no longer a bully to you. That you would turn around and then give your life away. You, you just, it just becomes an instrument of kingdom reality. No longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That's the gospel, y'all. That's it. That's the kingdom of God. You no longer live for yourself. Is Jesus king? That's, that's the question that you and I have to ask ourselves. Just, just bow your heads with me right now. I want you to get honest with yourself. Just let the Holy Spirit guide you in this moment. Wrestle with this question. Is Jesus our king? Is Jesus our King? If He is, then we no longer handle earthly resources for ourselves. Ask this question. Is my bank statement generous, generational, and strategic? Just, just let, let God point it out. Is my bank account because it's in the bank account, right? Who, who I worship and what I value. 
Is it generous? Is it generational? Is it strategic? You just heard a story of a family who said, we were at rock bottom. We were living and we didn't even know where we we're going to get our next meal. And there was going to be another generation of kids living that way. And yet we just made Jesus king of everything. And we started with our earthly possessions. And now generations are changing. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, just that sacred moment, ask this final question. Have I made king of my earthly resources? Just, just, just be honest about it. Have I made Jesus king of my earthly resources? And if you have, go to the new and deeper, right? The sonar is, is telling you what, what, what the depths are, what's next for you. Because the longer that you follow Jesus and the longer that you make him king of your earthly resources, the more you will increase in your love for God and your love for others. And it'll be reflected in your earthly resources. You just heard the story of two people who said, we're going to give and give and give and God just keeps trusting us with more. So we're getting ready to sing. This is gonna be a time of response. And here's what I want you to do. I think there are marriages and families that are reflected about where the Mustakases were maybe a season or two ago. And, and it's wreaking havoc on your marriage. It's wreaking havoc on your faith. And, and you've, you've gone to Bible studies and, you've, and, you, and you listen to worship music and you, and, and you, and you do all of these things that, that are important and they're good, but you today have heard from the Lord, start with your possessions. Let me be king of these things. And I will open up new dimensions in your faith and new dimensions in your ministry and new dimensions in your generational legacy. And if you're here today, and you just need prayer, and you just need to declare something publicly, I'm gonna invite you to come down here and just, just put, put your pride away and say, God, I, I declare this today that you are king. You are king of everything in my life, and you just come down here. Maybe you wanna get to your knees right where you're sitting and just, and just have a moment with the Lord, and if you do, if there's somebody who came with you, man, just put your hand on their shoulder and, and, and just intercede for them right now. But I believe, just like the Mustakases came up here, there's some generational strongholds that need to be, that, that, uh, greed, poverty mindset, a mindset of debt and consumerism. And today you're declaring, no more. I'm not giving this to my future marriage. I'm not giving this to my children. I'm not giving this to my children's children. I am gonna be an agent of the kingdom of God and Jesus is gonna have king of everything in my life today. Yeah, you can clap for that. You can clap for that. If that's you, as we start to sing, I want you to come down here. Some of you, you're, 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 uh, you're a one-person household. You're a young professional. You're, you're not married. You may or may not get married. You don't know that right now, but right now you know that you need to make Jesus king of everything. And if, if you feel the, the, the compelling of the Holy Spirit to come down here, we're going to pray for you. We're going to sing. We're going to respond. And then let's make a way, y'all.